In southeast Rwanda, agricultural lands coexist with a patch of savanna forest and papyrus wetlands. Amongst the rich biodiversity of this habitat lives the endangered grey crowned crane. Each night the bird roosts in native trees such as the acacia. Below ground, the roots of these trees produce nitrogen that vastly improves soil fertility. The crane relies on the wetland and savanna for food. Birds help control insect populations that can otherwise infest crops or spread disease. Across the country, land is being cleared to make room for agriculture and to acquire firewood. This is not just the story of losing a bird or a tree or a termite. As resources are depleted, the ecosystem that has the ability to replenish them and feed people is no longer there. Today, 80% of the land in Rwanda is employed for food production and yet 21% of the population remains food insecure. By 2050, the population will double and the sustainable productivity of the farmlands must rise to meet increased demands. Human, animal and ecological systems are inextricably intertwined. One Health is a global strategy to leverage these interrelationships and address the world's crises of food and insecurity and extreme weather events. The Howard G. Buffett Foundation has committed 125 million US dollars to create and operate the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. RICA will train a new generation of leaders to adopt and promote conservation agriculture to support sustainable food production. In year one, students live and work together. In year two, students move from small-scale practices to cooperative farming, including gaining exposure to value-added processing in six priority agriculture enterprises. In year three, students develop specialized expertise and spend time off campus, working directly with farmers and the agriculture sector. Students and faculty will convene in the campus center and dining hall. Diversified program strips showcase all aspects of the curriculum.
By looking at the entire supply chain and analyzing the embodied carbon that is created in the construction process, then choices can be made to align with the One Health approach. Agriculture has historically been one of the least desirable careers paths for college-bound students. Riga is transforming that perspective. In the first year of the school, eight full slots are available. Rika received over 7,000 applicants. That was a little bit about uh, what we did. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got there um, and how we work through these processes. Um, what you see on the screen here is what we call the impact design methodology. And this is a way that we work with our partners to especially as a group when there are a lot of um, different interests represented, how do we all together um, understand what is the mission of the project and how might design architecture, landscape architecture, help to support that mission. In this case, the mission was to train the next generation of leaders in conservation agriculture um, to attain a healthy and sustainable food independence for Rwanda into the future. And the methodology here was to use an experiential curriculum practical research and, and comprehensive extension services, um, and especially to apply the One Health and conservation-based approach to agriculture and demonstrate that on the campus. The hope is that our graduates become entrepreneurs, that they implement One Health and conservation principles throughout the value supply chain, um, and that hopefully that these techniques are adopted across Aranda so that their soils, their water, um, their ecologies are able to support this growing need for food into the future as they begin to intensify their production. One Health, as you know, is the uh, interlinked um, relationship between human, ecological, and animal health. Um, and especially here on this campus, we thought about a lot, what, what does that mean for an agricultural space? Um, for one, it means zoonotic disease transmission prevention, which is kind of the main principles around the One Health uh, approach in general, especially across the um, uh, animal and human disciplines, um, but as well regenerative agricultural practices, a harm no species approach, which really is about creating, sustaining, um, and conserving existing ecologies, as well as expanding them where possible and having them at close relationship to agriculture, um, and then sequestration. Um, from our perspective, a One Health approach is hard to separate from the need to be aware of our embodied carbon uh, footprint as we're working. And so sequestration is one way to begin to offset that and making sure that every site is doing the most that it can across all of these sectors. In particular, here we are looking at a degraded landscape that we illustrated, um, monoculture trap testing, livestock, gra livestock grazing that have gone right down to the wetlands and into the lake. Uh, and the hope is to, by creating one health approach and conditions, we can actually regenerate this plot of land, retain its existing fertility, and build it into the future. Um, as well, provide a really uh, amazing campus to demonstrate all of these approaches, um, provide silviculture for biomass, um, livelihoods, natural resources, which have currently, that is part of what's depleted the existing um, ecologies and forests in Rwanda. Um, and provide agroforestry agri plots and again, protect the water and, and soil resources. Interestingly, when we started this project, uh, UNL, um, the University of Nebraska, had not yet joined as um, the team that was going to begin to develop the curriculum and run the school. And so we, having, it be, it's quite difficult to design an entire campus without having a curriculum that that campus is serving. And so we took the opportunity to create the curriculum. Um, having lived and worked in Rwanda for uh, over eight years um, across many of our teammates, um, we, and understanding, uh, you know, a lot of the context as well as doing a lot of research about how agriculture happens. Um, again, we thought that the One Health approach to the curriculum would also be applicable. Um, and we implemented that throughout the campus. Um, we looked specifically at a three-year program, understanding that agricultural ac agriculture actually happens year-round and that the students would stay there and thereby gain that extra year. Um, and that in their first year, they would live on campus in uh, shareholder crop uh, size uh, buildings with their own land surroundings. 
thereby understanding, you know, what it is to be a small scale farmer in Rwanda, but then moving into enterprise cooperative farming in their second year and then doing capstone projects in their first year, for third year to think about how they're going to begin to apply um, their agricultural knowledge. The campus itself um, has its own IDM um, and and a kind of idea about what it needs to achieve. And in this case, it was to demonstrate the principles of One Health, as well as elevate the perception of agriculture in Rwanda. And I won't go into detail about all of our methods, impact and systems change, but each of these again are developed um, cooperatively and collaboratively with our, our partners so that we're all moving together in the same direction. Of course, we started with a deep site assessment, I think on any campus, especially at a large scale, this is 1300 hectares um, with an existing extension uh, testing campus that had been running there for about 20 or 30 years. It's really important to know what your assets are and what is the quality um, from an agricultural perspective, ecological perspective of what's contained there. We looked at the topography, did slope, slope analysis, understood the hydrology. We worked with local ecologists uh, who are now currently employed as teachers at the university um, to do a full ecological site assessment. And that's where we learned of this um, intact and highly valuable savanna woodland that we chose to uh, retain. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We did soil assessments to understand where the most fertile soils were on the campus, water quality assessments, understood conceptually if solar would be an option, <clears throat> did traffic surveys, and then started to look at uh, what might our material resources be. By learning about this uh, savanna woodland, which are second only to rainforests in their innate biodiversity, um, we realized that this is a huge asset, um, both from the sequestration perspective, but more importantly, to understand and value um, ecology as something that needs to coexist with agriculture and that if you remove it completely, then agriculture over time will, will, will function less, less, less ideally. Um, this savanna woodland is the only savanna woodland surviving outside of the national park, um, which also was reduced by 70% in the past 10 years. And so this becomes even more valuable in that context. The idea here is to think about that woodland savanna, the wetlands that surround it, as well as a seasonal wetland, which is currently grazed, um, and how, the, how those become assets for the site um, and become less degraded and provide ecological services. And then where do we place this campus? How do we look for the most quality areas um, so that we're providing the highest and best use for every square meter of the 1,400, 1,300 hectares? So again, we preserved this biodiverse area and then through the studies of the soil and as well looking at areas that were existing um, already for agriculture, determined and kind of prioritized which zones would be best suited for the campus itself. And then looking for planning for intensification, one of the approaches um, with our partner is an interest in pivots, which are really great at water uh, conservation. Um, and their interest is in looking to see how those can expand, is particularly in this area of Eastern Rwanda, which has much less slope than the rest of the country, um, but suffers from uh, a slightly more arid um, climate. And by testing as well, the, the water uh, abilities of these lakes, their quality, and how they might support that kind of agriculture in this area. And that led us to this conceptual zoning. What, what parts of the campus might we use for which types of um, productivity? Looking at biomass for this area, which is an extremely degraded, uh, basically a forest like the Savannah Woodland, but cut off at about uh, two feet with lots of you know, excellent um, ground vegetation, but really non-productive at this point. It's been used mostly for charcoal production. This area of future expansion where the farm might continue, again, based on soil tests. And then here thinking about this as a restored ecology, potentially linking up with the Savannah Woodland um, or expanding. I think over time, you know, this, this will probably uh, shift if there is a need for even further expansion. And so their analysis really became design. We located the campus in the most fertile area that had the closest access to um, water and irrigation. Um, and that had a slope that would be easy to build on. 
And then as we started to lay this campus out, basically from scratch, thinking about how we organize the site from smallholder and private, meaning the residential area where the first year farms are, and then how that shifts over to a much more public uh, program where we have academics, where we have um, visit lots of visiting farmers in the extension, um, and as well the more mechanized areas of farming. And then begin to lay in um, the, the different uh, programs in that way. The reason that the circle is a part of this is because uh, pivot irrigation even early on was even more so present and so it was a way of creating a coherent way of looking at the site across, um, across the entire uh, land area. And then thinking about connecting, um, connecting all of these programs using the One Health landscape um, and these zones of amazing plant collections, um, of different demonstrations of agroforestry, um, different types of irrigation, different types of fertilization that could embed themselves in this strip connection. But as well, <clears throat> really using the buildings to bridge across and thinking about them, how these buildings might illustrate the raw to processed um, approach uh, in terms of how we have value add in agriculture, especially needed in Rwanda. And then finally connecting it with what we call the spine, which is this kind of curvilinear corridor that connects the campus from the residential area all the way through academics and finally to the extension um, campus. And so we end up here and this has continued to um, to uh, change over time, um, but landing uh, the majority of the programming on the campus. And then conceptually, once we understood how the curriculum would inform the layout and the buildings, now we have to really understand how is this gonna function and how do we manage all of the flows? Having done uh, multiple hospitals in Rwanda, you know, we, we learned that this isn't dissimilar in the way that you have to be really attentive to flows, all the different types of material that are moving through all of these spaces, how to think about them from a biosafety perspective, what things need to be kept separate, need to have a different way of moving across the campus. And as well that there are so many circular systems here, how are we reusing um, the waste from the animals um, as, and, and uh, prepping it to be fertilizer, how are we making sure that everything is cleaned um, through the stormwater and um, green infrastructure before any waters, whether stormwater otherwise uh, make their way to the lake. <clears throat> becomes more complicated. This is the waste streams that I was talking about. Um, adding in vehicular, um, where do we locate all of the academic spaces? How adjacent do they want to be to all of these different um, learning places? And then <clears throat> again, vehicular access and how do, how do we move within the campus and how do we manage any vehicles that are coming from without the campus? Again, um, really thinking carefully about biosafety control. And so this again is the final where we landed and what is currently being built on the site. Um, it's about 40 hectares extending uh, from east to west across this low lying area of the site with the, uh, as you can see in the back here, um, the beautiful uh, Savannah woodland there. And then again, we have another uh, mission or a clear direction for what we think the building should do. Um, and for us here, it was about creating a replicable model of One Health agriculture teaching facilities. Um, so that, you know, things that work here, especially as you'll see, we used a lot of local materials um, and uh, local labor. And the idea being that if we can create an effective uh, building that this could be applied to other, other campuses across the country. There are one or two other agricultural campuses. Um, and again, <clears throat> one of the main approaches, especially for the enterprise areas, uh, which is where we, um, where it's all about the agricultural production from tree and veg production all the way through our cow and goat barns, the milk parlor, um, sorry, the uh, beef production, mechan irrigation, um, crop, pro crop production, all of those were different enterprises along the campus. And in this one in particular, we're looking at the dairy uphill um, and our tree and veg programming downhill. And the idea that these buildings extend into the fields um, where we begin to have uh, where production is coming from, grazing or um, crop fields, and that <clears throat> the building itself is kind of along the line of what kind of uh, um, processing and value added will happen um, as they move closer to the corridor. And then those finished products, um, whether they're food related, there's a, um, a, a dairy bar over here, 
um, are evident in, in the area where most of the people will be moving through the campus. Again, we use this idea of form function and fabrication to really think about, <clears throat> especially for form, the challenge here was how do you have circulation through the building um, without uh, compromising those biosafety boundaries? Um, how do you be able to have students observe and sometimes engage? Um, how do you provide for when they do have to engage that they can clean afterwards? Um, so really applying to circulation as well as some of the programming. And this is how we started to break that down and understand what was needed across each and every um, of these enterprises. What are the different programming? And of course, this is something that we went back and forth with all of our, um, at this time UNL had been brought on. And so we kind of worked through this with the farmers um, who each had expertise in each of these enterprises. So beef cattle and small ruminants, our poultry and swine, we went through the same process, understanding <clears throat> how many, how many layers we would have, which would then translate into how large the building should be and where that needs to be relative to grazing, fattening, handling, slaughter, etc. Again, similarly for dairy, where we have goats and cattle um, on this, um, in, incorporated into this enterprise. Um, how, are, how is the milking happening? How are we cooling it? How is it getting processed and then um, utilized? In this case, first and foremost in the campus um, dining room, but then uh, potentially depending on production could be utilized elsewhere. Row and forage crops, um, same idea, looking at how we move things from the field, um, clean them, potentially preserve or change them into uh, canning them or into other um, products so that they have longer shelf life, which is really key in Rwanda where there isn't widespread uh, refrigeration. Mech and irrigation, how are we um, taking care of all of the equipment that's managing this large farm? And then again, this is kind of embedding an enterprise into the landscape. How is it related? Um, how are we managing the slope? And how are we thinking about, especially on the top, how all of the elements of the building are related and embedded into the landscapes that are adjacent? And how can those things work fluidly together? Just to give a little bit of a um, look into uh, vegetable and tree crop enterprise to show how we worked through this building in particular. Again, starting with this diagram about that functionality and then really starting to understand what comes next. What are the right adjacencies building on that prior diagram, laying in vehicular access and pedestrian access, and as well the academic programming that would be needed to support these. Starting off, then how do we put this into a building form, um, make sure, making sure all those flows are accounted for. And then <clears throat> again, landing it in, into this slight slope. Rwanda is called the land of a thousand hills and there isn't any place that's flat as, <laughs> as we're uh, more familiar with um, some of our industrial agriculture here in the States. Um, and so everything has to negotiate a slope here. Starting to formalize those into actual spaces, how much you know, and verifying again um, with our partners, with farmers um, and academics who are going to be using these spaces, really trying to make sure that we're fit sizing these properly. And then beginning to turn all of that into floor plans and, and architecture. Again, starting to think about how we're going to negotiate that slope. Where are we going to have this amazing test kitchen with great local Rwandan chefs um, and this beautiful outdoor eating area. <clears throat> and then this is the kind of um, where we land in terms of the architectural form. Um, again, all of this is using a lot of the um, approaches that we've developed in Rwanda and are using in our buildings worldwide, but how can we maximize things like natural ventilation, natural lighting to really reduce the, um, um, the burden of, from an uh, energy standpoint of how these buildings function. Um, and so we're really, <clears throat> these buildings illustrate how that would work both for um, the productive side of, of the work here, but as well for the academic side. In the background, you can see our um, row crop uh, storage that zone for uh, silos and, and our other um, row crop production facilities. And here we are uh, in construction. We are about halfway through now. This is Tree and Veg, which was the first um, academic building to be built after the residential buildings. Our students started um, in November, September of last year. Um, and today, as of today, they are back on campus um, in a COVID bubble um, and continuing to do the work. Um, we started to have livestock show up on site um, for some of the first year farms work. 
And these are some of the other buildings that are uh, in, in, in construction currently. So it's a big project. This is the um, campus center. Uh, and you can see here though, we're still really trying to understand how we use local and natural products. And I'll go into a little bit about why that's important. Uh, and this is just an overview of the campus um, and you know how we imagine it to be um, with the spine running through and connecting all of these different extensions. Um, these are some of the barns uh, for the livestock. These are uh, meant to be goats. They look like sheep, um, but this is our um, goat and dairy enterprise. Um, this is the first year farm. Um, this is when they each uh, farm a plot of about uh, just between one and a half and two hectares um, and learn how to manage and build soils and clear um, and other aspects that small farmers are having to deal with um, all the time. This is again a um, entry into the campus center with the dining hall on the left there. Um, Rwanda has a really lovely climate. It's about 75 uh, degrees year round and so you can really take advantage of that. And then one thing I really wanted to touch on is, again, how does uh, carbon sequestration or carbon um, embodied carbon and how we deal with it come into One Health? I think for us, it's part and parcel because if we cannot manage that issue, then we're going to have to, you know, the continued degradation of the natural lands that really support um, our ability to, to be able to have a productive future are, are really reduced. So. Um, we focused on, and you know, our projects in general tend to, on average, come in um, at half of or near half of the global average um, because we tend to prioritize the use of local materials and labor. Um, but we also are, you know, applying now this idea of good, clean, and fair um, coming from the food movement. How might that apply to architecture? Um, of course, we've always uh, been proponents of the idea that everyone deserves the best design um, and the best architecture and that can support um, better healing, better work of clinicians, um, better learning. Um, clean being this idea that um, our projects need to be doing their best to um, be part of a restorative and regenerative supply chain. And finally, fair, again, looking at our design process or our construction processes and how do we make sure that we're having safe and equitable label practices. We're able to um, hire and do rotational hiring so that we can maximize the impact of um, our project on local economy. And, and we've been looking at how we can translate some of these approaches, especially to the United States and doing that on multiple projects here now. And so we land at uh, Farika at two fifths of the um, international average for carbon, um, embodied carbon for a building, which is quite low. And mainly we did that by, again, sourcing the majority of our materials from um, the site. First of all, we kept our carbon, operational carbon really low, having 100% renewable energy by having our solar um, generation on site. Um, and then as well, you know, maximizing natural and natural emulation and natural lighting, um, but also getting the majority of our materials, 96% locally. Um, looking at, you know, if we use typical materials like concrete um, and steel, you end up with a really high embodied carbon. We are here, we translated that into um, compressed earth blocks, all um, made from soils on site that were appropriate, as well as rammed earth. We also used tile um, from the local uh, um, brickery um, that's fired using um, agricultural byproducts. And as well, we, um, we located and our engineering team spent a lot of time verifying um, what kind of timber we could use in country. Again, stone aggregate and sand, everything is sourced within a mile, 10 miles, up to 100 miles um, just outside of, of, of the site and, and within Rwanda. And then occasionally, you know, a few things we had to go um, further for. So our, I think the, the biggest um, carbon um, footprint item was our solar plant. Um, we had also some gypsum, some other things, but things that are, you know, produced um, by more complex um, material supply chains um, and had to be sourced outside. And then again, we sourced 90% of Rico's um, labor locally. And again, to try to disperse as much as possible, invest in, you know, amazing Rwandan craftsmen. This is Willaris and his ceramics work. They did all the tile for our test kitchen and for um, all of our dining areas across campus. 
um, working with weavers, um, doing local furnishing with locally uh, sustainable wood sources. Um, these weavers uh, focusing on this amazing furnishing that we put into all of the buildings. Um, but again, how do we get to carbon positive? That, you know, what we can do in the buildings is always going to be an ad. It's always going to be um, having some embodied carbon, no matter how we try to reduce it. And so we really have to work and rely on the landscape um, to balance those efforts. Um, and so the kind of approach that we think about from a landscape perspective is how can we come to every site, not just large sites like this one, but even smaller sites thinking about how do we conserve anything that's intact and functioning? How do we restore ecological functions to areas that are degraded? How can we proliferate diverse biodiversity through the rest of the landscape design? And or are there opportunities where we can sequester uh, more intensively and how do we do that? And so really thinking about conservation, restoration, and regeneration. And again, here we did that through the main uh, sequestering tool here is that savanna forest, um, but also preserving these um, wetlands that are going to do a huge amount of work to make sure that the water, any water is clean that's running um, from this farm. And then uh, putting the agriculture in the best possible place. So that is everything, um, you know, uh, about the uh, campus. And we're super excited that we've gotten some peer reviewing of our carbon um, analysis from Atelier 10. And have we learned that this project can, with um, the proposed restoration areas, achieve carbon positive in six years, which is an extremely um, low timeline, short timeline. One of the questions that we get a lot is if you can do that in Rwanda, but that's a totally different place, you know, can, can you do that in a developed country? And for sure, we're trying to think about how do we apply these things that we've learned about working in Rwanda over the past 10 years from healthcare to education um, and now to multiple universities and agricultural campuses, is that are, are the ways that we've managed to achieve you know, that kind of what we think of as success, you know, having um, a very um, low impact campus. Can we can we do that here? Um, this is the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, um, which is in the Hudson Valley uh, in an amazing um, what's called the Black Soils um, uh, Valley here, um, which has been flooding, you know, over time, which is, you know, what obviously gives it this immense fertility. Um, but also puts it and, and all of the farms um, that, that work along it and take advantage of these rich soils um, in, a, in a FEMA flood hazard zone. <clears throat> and those hazards increasing obviously over time with, the, with climate change. Um, and as well, a really interesting hydrogra hydrography. And then of course the really, um, again, rich ecological zones that come alongside this riparian corridor um, and that in this on this particular campus, they have um, a team that's dedicated to agroecology. They have a couple of researchers from Cornell um, and they are proliferating studies across the campus to really understand how um, ecology and agriculture um, support each other uh, or at least um, do, do, do better and, and kind of create a more um, fertile and, and less damaging um, end result. And then in this case, we're dealing with an existing campus. Um, there are a lot of um, existing buildings. Most farms grow over time through accretion. You build as you need um, to expand. Uh, and so the big, you know, one of the big questions is how, how to create a sense of a campus in a place that hasn't necessarily been built um, to create that, um, but more so to, as needed. Uh, and so that was the challenge here is how to kind of expand all of the darker buildings are the expanded expansion buildings. Um, and as the parking lot is also new, but some of these buildings outlined in white um, are all the existing buildings, um, including their wash and pack, their um, tractor areas, their silos and granaries, um, their uh, shop. Um, and the shop is actually the first building it was this very small building in 10 and is expanding to this uh, much larger building, number 23, to accommodate um, partially what they do is, is kind of testing of different approaches to agriculture and which may require um, different equipment and being able to kind of work on that in an ample space. And so that's the first building that's currently under construction. 
But their goal is to be a resource for regional farms on how to build farm and farm in a flood prone area and to be that way by 2029. But again, we wanted to work with them to think about how do we understand when we know that not only is construction itself, um, but also agriculture resp responsible for a large chunk of our emissions. Um, and by working with both of those areas, construction and, um, and how we're growing food, we can think about how we can reduce that carbon. And so we wanted to think about, again, how do we think, how do we look at the materials that we're using and, and minimize our, our carbon footprint? We went through um, what typical farm buildings look like, how they're built, and what their typical material options are, and then tried to think about what might alternatives be that are more local and more uh, and lower carbon footprint um, that could uh, replace different aspects of these. And so the big opportunity here is, you know, roofs need to be watertight, so those are most likely going to be steel or um, similar. Foundations are going to need to be superstructural, so those are going to be um, concrete and, and steel as well. Um, but the big opportunity here is um, in the infill. And so we looked a little bit into that. Um, what if this was the first campus to uh, pr produce the majority of the campus on site? What if like locally grown food, you have locally sourced buildings? Um, and they have also um, around uh, 1,600 acres um in this amazing valley and do a lot of um vegetable production um, but certainly have space to do other kinds of productions and so that was the question of what kind of elements might be viable we could use soil we could also use something like um straw bale which you know for this climate not only provides um you know is good for insulating um but but also can be grown on the campus and so we kind of just did quick analyses to understand what would it take um, you know, how many bales, if you use the typical three string bale, would you need? Do you need 2,500? And depending on the yield of, of the soils, you could get, you know, between 20 and 100 bales per acre, which would mean that um, you would need 25 um, to 125 acres to produce all of the, uh, all of the straw needed for the shop is what we were testing it on for that first building. Um, within one year, which is pretty minimal for the amount of area that they have. Similarly, we looked just very quickly just to see um, what might it look like if you uh, used wool for insulation, which has um, got great kind of um, anti-mold uh, and anti-non-flammable anti, um, um, uh, characteristics. Works really great as um, an insulation as well, has a really long lifespan. Um, and found that uh, it would take, what, uh, 325 feet um, over the course of um, two years, I think, to produce that. And then, you know, for all the other things that we might not be able to grow on site, where would we get them? And how do we think about what the local resources are and try to get things as close to the campus as possible, supporting local industry, but also minimizing um, the transportation emissions? And thinking about, you know, what if the Farm Hub was the first carbon positive campus in the region, proving that this is a viable way to build at institutional scale. And then finally, before I finish, I'm just going to take um, the last two minutes that I have and talk quickly about um, a third project, <clears throat> which is embedded in our um, food systems lab. We have four labs in our office where we're really looking at kind of new areas of um, design. And one of them is food systems and how do we think about how design can contribute to shifting our, our food systems and way of production <clears throat> um, to be less tenuous in the future. And this, what's called Good Shepherd Conservancy is working with um, Frank Reese, who's an amazing um, heritage poultry farmer, one of the last and, and largest of heritage poultry farmers in the United States, and really interested in um, bringing farmers there to teach them how to protect biodiversity, um, teach poultry breeding, and uh, and work closely with humane husbandry, um, culinary traditions, diverse agroecology approaches. Um, he gets tons of requests um, in the kind of poultry field from people all over the world saying, you know, what breeds should I use? And, what he is trying to, you know, of course you don't want to use a breed that he's using. You need to figure out what your local heritage breeds are. And so this is a way to have people from all over the world um, come and learn about how to 
um, tap back into the importance of having diverse heritage um, species, um, whether it's in, in poultry, um, but across the board, if we, we need to protect our, our biological and especially our food production diversity. And so he really needs this infrastructure and operational support to teach other farmers the science um, around this. He has um, a number of acres in uh, um, the middle of the country and you know, his hope is to create a place that also showcases um, the food. And so we spent a bunch of time with them understanding how they work now, um, the numbers of uh, animals that they currently can maintain, what the expansion might look like, how are they functioning now and how do we make sure to, to build on the things that are working really well for them and how do we improve on, on other aspects? How do we understand the site? Um, what do we think, you know, how do we want to approach preserving the, the, the native prairie that's there? um alongside uh the cropland and then how do we situate any new programming amongst uh amongst those existing uses again his mission just to come back to this we worked through this with him as well um to teach farmers the science of standard bred poultry preserve biodiversity and save breeds and then gather and disseminate national historical uh, legacy of poultry production and the method is to really um, create a building that will support and maintain um, the breeding, memorialize and protect living history, create proximity so that people who are visiting and being there as students are able to, um, you know, either observe or work with in a safe way um, the animals um, and then bring engagement. And so again, it's this marrying of the landscape, the farm and the visitors in the safest possible way. Um, and providing them with a really valuable experience while they're there, whether as visitors or um, um, farmers who are under under instruction. Understanding, you know, what are the spatial implications for all those programs? So how much do we need um, to, to support them each? And then how do we think about the educational space, the public space, and the threshold between especially the farmland um, area or the, the turkey yards and the, the poultry yards um, with any anyone that will be visiting? And so looking at different ways of doing that. Are there ways to combine it um, so that there is access um, which would be helpful considering the weather of the region. Does there need to be a slight separation or stark edge between the education and the public? Do they need to be um, even completely separate? And so really looking at, um, obviously we, you know, the hope is that we can find the best way for um, people to have either visual access if they're visitors observing or actual access if they're there learning, um, but then also providing you know, clean areas to clean and make sure that we're attending to, again, the biosafety issues involved with the overlap of humans and animals in production settings. And so this is the result of that um, project currently in the fundraising phases. We often work with um, thought leaders who are really early on in thinking about um, what's needed. And, and so we'll do early design to help uh, visualize the, the potential of the project and then um, uh, work and work with them to um, um, as they fundraise for this um, so that it can be implemented. So uh, that's it. I'm at time and wanted to um, thank you again for listening in a little bit about how we think about um, One Health and, and how that overlaps with, you know, agricultural um, design for, for campuses and, and buildings. Uh, and so happy to talk more about this um, when we meet over Zoom soon. Thanks so much.